Nine, section five. Greek letters. We just love Greek letters and math and physics and stuff like that. Capital Sigma provides a shorthand notation for summation. So we looked at some sequences, some numbers. Well, here's a sequence of numbers. I bet you can figure out what comes next. Nine. Nine. Very good. If I add all these together, then we have a summation. Add them all together. <laughs> yeah, we could call it a sum too. It's a summation of a sequence, which is called a series. What do you get? 25, is Nate right? 25. All right, summation. So, definition of summation notation. So, right here, we have this Greek letter sigma. This is the capital sigma. So it's the summation of these terms, whatever those are. So it says it's the sum of the terms in the sequence, a sub 1, a sub 2, all the way to a sub n, whatever it is. So how we read this, the summation of these terms from k equals 1, so that's where we start, to whatever the n number is. So here's how we read it. The sum of a sub k from k equals 1 to n. So now you know a new language. Well, we actually saw that down for two. But that's how we read that right there. The variable k is called the index of summation. So right down here, we are going to tell a little story, and then we'll get back into our summations. This guy called Gauss. You remember our matrices and we talked about Gaussian elimination? That's the guy. So here's the story. I don't know if it's true, but I don't want to look it up because it's such a good story. Supposedly, Gauss was just a little kid in elementary school. Maybe he was in first grade. And he was in this one-room school full of students, and the teacher had just about had enough that day and was needing some peace and quiet. Once in a while that happens to teachers. They just need some peace and quiet. So that teacher said, go take your slates and your little charcoal pencils or whatever you have, and write down the numbers from 1 to 100 and add them up. And the teacher took a deep breath, sat down in the chair, and thought, finally, I have some peace and quiet. And little Mr. Gauss, little boy Gauss, comes up and he says, I've got the answer. I was like, what? I just gave that to you. How could you have the answer? of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way to 100. I mean, 30 seconds later, here he comes. Well, this little first grader says, well, it's easy, teacher. All you do is you have 1 through 100. Well, I'm not going to write them all down. We know what they kind of look like. And then if I reverse the order, 199 and 97, all the way down to 1. And if I added these together, Every single one of them is 101. How many 101s would I have? I would have 100 101s. Well, 100 and 101, that's easy to do. All you have to do is add two zeros on the end. Now, the only problem with this is my answer is twice as big as it should be, right? So let's just divide it by two. <laughs> now, I was not that first grader, like, Gauss was. <laughs> but some people just think like that. And he's, the, like I say, I don't know if that story is true or not, but what a good story. And so he's credited with this idea of coming up with, oh, this is an easy way to do that. Is it true? Once we wrote it out, does that work? Yeah. I mean, once we see it, it's like, oh, sure enough. Now, I may not dream that up, but somebody obviously dreamed it up. We have a few formulas in this chapter to memorize. We have an arithmetic sequence. Remember the a sub 1 times n minus 1 times d. You need to know that. The geometric one, a sub 1 equals, or a sub n equals a sub 1 times r raised to the n minus 1. This is going to be the sum of a finite arithmetic sequence. This is an arithmetic sequence back here. 
we're just adding one each time. We start with one and we add one. Goes to two, add one more, goes to three, add one more. So it's arithmetic. Common difference happens to be one in that case. And all we need to do is figure out the number of terms we have. Well, we figured out a minute ago there were 100 terms if you're going from 1 to 100. And add the first and the last term together, 1 plus 100. Well, that gave us our 101. And then divide it by 2. So it's the same thing that Gauss did, just written out in a formal way down there. Now, there's an alternate formula here, and that alternate formula simply is, well, what if I don't know what my last term is? Maybe I only know, like, the first three, and they say, find the sum of the first 75 of these. So how do I get that 75th term? Well, we know how to get the 75th term of an arithmetic sequence. We'll take the first term plus n minus 1 times the common difference is how we'll get it. So if a sub n here is that equation, then if I take a sub 1 and add it to this equation, a sub 1 plus n minus 1 times d, well, I get 2 a sub 1s plus n minus 1 times d, and that's where that came from. So they're just saying, oh, well, we have a formula for a sub n. In case you don't know it, just throw it in there. I just memorized the one I circled in red, and I can figure out the other one if I need it. If you want to memorize them both, you may. So let's try this one. A corner section of a stadium happens to have eight seats on the front row, and then each successive row has two more seats, 8, 10, 12, 14. If the top row happens to have 24 seats, well, then how many are there total in that entire section? First row is 8, last row is 24, and there are two more each time. How many are in the entire section? Before this class, we would have got 8 plus 10 plus 12 plus 4. We just added those all up. But now we are smarter than that. We say, oh, I know the first term is 8. And I know that my last term, my nth term, is 24. And all that I need to know after that is... How many terms are there in this row? If you need to, count them out on your finger. You start at 8, you go to 24, and you're going by 2s. How many rows are there? I'm serious when I say if you need to. I mean, count it out on your finger. Are there 8 rows? I don't know. Eight or nine? Eight. Twenty-four minus eight is whatever number. No, no, no. But you include the row eight, though. That's why I literally said, yeah, "Hey, count them out of your finger if you need to." Eight, 16. 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. There's nine. Nine rows. So I know the number of rows I have is nine. Now all I need to do is apply that thing right there. I'll go nine times first row eight plus last row twenty-four. Divide by 2. Well, what's 8 plus 24? 8 plus, we don't need a calculator. 32. Divided by 2. 16. 9 times 16? 144. There's 144 seats in that section. Quick math. We can support it. Now, I'm not going to take the time, but the other day we saw how we could enter sequences in our calculator. Well, we can find sums of sequences. And so here is the formula. Now, where does that come from? This is a sub 1, 8, plus n minus 1 times a common difference, 2. And n is our variable. We're starting with row 1 and we're ending with row 9. And that happens to be 144. So sometime you can play around and enter it in, and sure enough. But that's not an important thing of what we're doing today. Sum of a finite geometric sequence. Sorry, there's no cool cow story to go with this one. <clears throat> we need to know this formula. You need to memorize this formula. So if I have a geometric sequence, which means what? What's a geometric sequence? Common ratio. Common ratio. Multiplied by the same number each time. Then I can find my sum this way. First term, 1 minus the common ratio raised to the n. I need to know how many terms there are divided by 1 minus the common ratio. So let's try it out. Find the sum of the geometric sequence that happens to have 4, negative 4 thirds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Well, we need to know what the first term is. The first term is? Four. I need to know what the common ratio is. Four over nine. Well, I'm going to do it by hand. I'm going to take negative four-thirds and divide it by four. Negative four-thirds, and I'm going to divide by four. Well, we don't divide when we have fractions. I'm going to multiply by one-fourth instead. So those fours cancel. Negative one-third. That's my common ratio. I need to know the number of terms that I have. Can you look at this sequence that was written out and tell me how many terms? No, to both of those. No, you can't. The answer is yes, we can. Oh, 11. How do we know it's 11? Remember what a term in a geometric looks like? A sub 1 times the common ratio raised to the n minus 1 power. There's our common ratio, negative 1 third. 10 is the number of terms minus 1, so there must be 11 terms in this one. Okay, so let's apply it. We have first term, 4, times 1 minus our common ratio, negative 1 third, which we are going to have to raise to the n power, which is 11, and then all of that divided by 1 minus negative 1 third. Why don't you try this on your calculator, because you have to be a little careful to get it all entered correctly. You got just three? Let me run through it and I'll uncover my calculator work. The sum of the sequence where, okay, here's the term, 4, a sub 1, common ratio, raised to the n minus 1, n is a variable, start at 1, stop at 11. It is it's not quite 3. It's not going to, it's not going to be exactly 3 because of our fraction here that we have. Well, so, I mean, it's not, that's not what we got. So that's what we got. That, I got that answer. Oh, you got this. You just told me three. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> it is really close to three, but it's not quite exactly three. Really, it's a fraction. I don't know if you can yeah, do can. math, and it's probably too much, and it probably won't handle it. You'd have to manually do it, which you could do. All that means is you get your answer for your numerator. Write it down. Oh. Over four thirds, which means you would multiply by three fourths, and there you would have your fraction. So it's not hard to do; just the calculator can't handle it as a fraction. Infinite series. So both of the other were finite, and it makes sense, right? If I have a finite number, I can add them all up and get an answer. How about taking an infinite one and adding them all up and getting an answer? Well, that's kind of hard to do. It seems like a little bit here. But in some cases, we actually can. Let's look at this last one, in fact, as an example. They just changed it to k. So here they use that summation notation. They say, find the summation of 4 times negative 1 third raised to the k minus 1. That's how we got each of those terms. From k equals 1 all the way up to n. And n is approaching infinity. As I'm getting bigger and bigger and bigger, what does that limit to? What does it become? Well, they use the formula right there. They just put it in the formula, just like we did. But looking at this part, if n is infinity, negative one-third raised to a bigger and bigger number, what happens to that fraction when we raise it to a higher and higher power? Smaller and smaller and smaller. One-third, one-ninth, one over 81. It gets tinier and tinier and tinier. So it limits to zero. zero. And then one minus a negative one third is that four thirds down there. And so one minus zero, that's just gone. Multiplied by three fours, it actually is three if I do it forever. If I do it less than forever, it's not exactly three. 
But if I do it forever, it gets to three. It approaches three. So there are some times when we actually can find a sum to an infinite series. So we'll be talking about that here, progressing with that idea. First of all, what's an infinite series? Well, we know what it is. It goes all the way to infinity. It just keeps on going, dot, dot, dot. Partial sums are the things we have been finding when we talk about a finite series. So if you think of an infinite list, well, if I take part of it, that's a finite series, a partial sum. So a sum of a finite series is a part of an infinite one. That's all that means, a partial sum. So partial sums, we have some answer, S, is their answer to it. If these are series that converge, we talked about that last time, where as I keep going down the list, those numbers get approach a value. If they are one where we approach a value, then the sum of that infinite series will exist. So those cases, we can find a sum when they converge to a value. If it's a diverging one, there's no sum to that. Quick example, well, we have some examples right here. For each of the following series, find the first five terms in the sequence of the partial sums. So it's a partial sum because it's only a part of a finite, infinite one. And then which of these appear to be converging? So one, two, three, four. Can you tell me what the next one would be? You can probably follow the pattern. One, three, four zeros. It's going to have four zeros. So it'll be 0 0.1234, and then a 1. What about this one? Do you think this one appears to converge to a value, a value that we know it's going to be? Um, zero. Well, let's just start adding these together. If I add the first two together, it would be 0.11, right? Then if I added this to it, there's another one. Added that, another one. This one, another one. This is just going to be point one 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 repeating. Do you know what that fraction is? It's not as common as like point three repeating, which is one third. One ninth. That's it. Yeah. One ninth. That's what it is. If you have point three repeating, it's actually three ninths, which reduces to one third. Point two repeating is two ninths. One night. Okay, so that one converges. This one converges to something. What's the next one here? That would be 50. So how about this one? If you start adding those up, is that going to converge to a number? No, it just keeps going higher and higher and higher and higher. So this one diverges. This one is not going to have any sum to that infinite series. What's the next one on this list? Well, no. No. On the list. Oh, one. It would be a one, right? It goes one, negative one, one, negative one, one. Now, if I add these two together, what is it? Zero. Zero. And then if I add one more, what is it? One. one. And then if I add one more, zero. zero. And add one more, one. Now, these are the answers. This is not digital you know, zeros and ones. How about that one? Is that converging to a value? No, it's alternating between zero and one. That would not have an infinite sum to it. This is a diverging one. does not have an infinite sum. But that first one actually did. We specifically have a formula for these sums when they converge. And here is when they converge. If the absolute value of the common ratio is less than one, now we say absolute value so that we can have negative common ratios. It's between zero and one. Absolute value positive between zero and one. Then it will converge. And the formula is simply this. A sub one divided by one minus R. Let me back up to this. A sub one, four is all we were left with on the top, divided by one minus R. That four thirds. This one fit the pattern. Oh, the common ratio on this one? The common ratio on this one was negative one third. Well, the absolute value of negative one third is less than one. That's one third. One third is less than one. So it fits, and if it fits, I can use that formula. You need to memorize this formula. 
the sum of an infinite geometric series that converges. And how do I know if it converges well if the absolute value of the copper ratio is less than 1? So determine whether these series converge, and if they do, figure out what the sum is. First of all, how do we figure out if it converges? I need to know what the common ratio is. Can you look at this and tell me the common ratio? Yeah, 3 fourths, 0.75. The common ratio is 3 fourths, or 0.75. Does it converge? Yes. So all I need to do is use this lovely formula right over there. I need to figure out the first term, so I'm going to get the sum here. What is going to be the first term? Well, in the summation notation, you substitute a 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. 0.75 to the 0 is 1. 3 times 1 is 3. three. So my first term is 3 divided by 1 minus the common ratio of 3 fourths. So what's 1 minus 3 fourths? So 3 divided by 1 fourth, we won't divide by 1 fourth, we'll multiply by 4 instead. One of those cool things in math where if you take that infinite series and add it all up, 12. That's the answer. <laughs> Do it forever. 12. What's the common ratio? The common ratio is negative 4 of 1. It's negative 4 fifths. That's the thing that we keep adding or multiplying again and again and again. So, is it a converging sequence? Yeah, it is. The absolute value is less than 1, so it is. So, what is my first term? 1. How did you get 1, Davis? 1 equals 0 from 0. Yeah, n starts at 0 this time. Anything to the 0 is 1. There's our first term, 1. Divided by 1, sorry, yes, 1 minus the common ratio. So 1 minus 4 fifths, so that would be 1 fifth, right? What's 1 divided by 1 fifth? 5. So do that one forever and you get 5. C down here, what's the common ratio? It's pi over 2. Pi over 2. Is this a converging one? What's pi divided by 2? 1.57 something, the answer is no. There is no sum on this one. That does not fit. It's not a converging series. That one just keeps getting bigger. Can't find an answer to that one. Okay, how about this one? What's the common ratio? One half. We're just multiplying by one half. So, yeah, it works. So if I take my first term, 1, divided by 1 minus 1 half, so that would be 1 divided by 1 half, which equals 2. What's that? I said, please, all of them. <laughs> well, they're pretty easy there. So the fun thing that um, I did in, often in Algebra 2 is I say, hey, you've got this shopping mall that is 31 miles away. And you don't have a car, but you do have a bicycle. And so you are going to ride. <laughs> And the first day, <laughs> you ride 15 miles and get tired, so you quit. You spend the night and you sleep beside the road. And the next day, you get up and you're kind of sore, so you only ride half as far as the day before. And you fall asleep and you wake up the next morning, you only ride half as far as you did the day before. How many days will it take you to get to the mall? How far is the mall? 31 miles away. Never. You never get to the mall. That's there horrible. It takes you a month. It takes you a month? What's the common ratio? One half. So this is a converging series. So I can add all these together forever and know what the answer is going to be. All I have to take is the first term divided by 1 minus 1 half, which is 15 divided by 1 half, which equals... You can see it on the horizon, but it's a mile away forever. I told you. That's right. Because you can't. Uh, you won't get there. You'll only get to 30 miles. Yeah. You'll never get to 31 miles. Because you keep dividing. Well, I could keep dividing and get there. I just happen to pick a number where you wouldn't get there. If the mall was 29 miles away, would you get there? Yeah. Yeah, you'd get there. I don't know how many days. You'd have to manually figure it out. But you'd get there if it was 29 miles away. But if it was 30 miles, I mean, it was 31 miles away, you wouldn't get there. Converting a repeating decimal to fraction form. Now I'm going to show you two examples. <coughs> repeating decimals. 
Well, this has a first term. Here's our thing written out, kind of written out. 0.234, 234, 234, and keeps up going. This has a first term of 0.234. Or, I'm going to write it as a fraction because it works easier for us, 234 thousandths. That's my first term. This has a common ratio of 1 one thousandths because my first term is right there, and then I add my next three numbers, which is one thousandth smaller than that, and then the next three, which is one thousandth smaller than that, is the number of PV decimals, one with three zeros, one thousandths. So this should fit our formula for a converging infinite series, because my common ratio is one one thousandth. So if I take my formula and take the first term, 234 over 1,000, and divide it by 1 minus the common ratio, which is 1 one thousandths, that would be 234 one thousandths, divided by 999 one thousandths. Well, we know we're going to multiply by that reciprocal instead. So we end up with 234 over 999. Does that reduce? Three? Yes, that reduces. Reduce that one for me. I know 9 goes. At least the bottom. 26 over 111. 26 over 111. Divide, take 26 and divide it by 111. Do we get that? Yeah. Like 234, 234, 234. Yes. Now it's going to stop on your calculator, obviously. Okay. We can apply this process to a more complicated number. Let me give you this number. The whole number is not repeating. It's 4.789898. Only the 89 is repeating. How can I change this into a fraction that's exactly equal to this? Because all repeating numbers are rational numbers, which means they have a rational, a fraction, a ratio that I can write them as. Won't, make, won't be a whole number, no. Well, I just pull off the part that is not repeating. I have 4 and 7 tenths, that's not repeating. And then I have the repeating part, the point 0, where that 7 was, 8, 9, 8, 9, 8, 9. So my first term is the point 0, 8, 9, or the 89 thousandths. And my repeating is 1 one hundredth, because there's two decimal places. So my first term is 89 thousandths, and my common ratio is 1 one hundredth. And then I apply it to my formula down here. So first term divided by 1 minus the common ratio. We go through it, and we get 89 over 990. Well, that's just the repeating part. We need to add that to the end of 4 and 7 tenths. So we'll take our 4 and 7 tenths and add our 89 over 990 to it, get our common denominator and put it together, and there it is. So take 2,371 and divide it by 495, and you should get 4.789898989. Any number that repeats, no matter where it starts repeating, you can use this idea and convert it into its rational fraction. So five is never repeat. Pi doesn't repeat. It's an irrational number. So you cannot do that with pi. I think that's it. Yep. So I must have some numbers for you. <laughs>